the advantage of the first speaker is that you can put your pop up there and then not get tossed about it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just give you a brief explanation as to what we did over there, but then how that led to my uh, interest and belief in um, what's beyond the buzzwords of diversity and inclusion. So I was a teacher for about 12 years, um, because those who can't teach, right, so I not figure out what I wanted to do yet. And uh, in that time I was teaching, I saw a lot of bullying, teachers always do, but a lot of that bullying uh, related to this crazy idea that we have that all human beings should be two ways, male or female, and lots of children don't belong to those two ways of being. So the, uh, what we saw is a lot of homophobia, and that is the tool that reinforces those gender constructs. Um, it, to, to get over that, we, we need a lot of courageous conversations, and a lot of teachers didn't know how to do that. We had an Equality Act introduced in the UK in 2010, faith and sexuality were at odds, and it didn't seem there was any clear answer. Around the same time, there was a spate of suicides, and um, Dominic Crouch was one of those, this young man here, 15 years old, played a game of spin the bottle with some of his peers on a school camp, uh, kissed another boy, he wasn't the only one, uh, photos taken, sent around the school, and he got called gay, of course. He jumped off a car park building the following week uh, when they returned um, to school. So I read that story and thought, actually, that's enough, that's 2010, and uh, we need to do something about this. We need to start having conversations with young people because taking your own life for reasons related to sexuality just seems like such a waste. So we launched, um, very quickly, I quit my job, we launched in the House of Commons, so we took off with a hiss and a roar, and Theresa May was her first uh, opportunity to speak. She'd actually traditionally voted against LGBT rights, and this is the first time that she had changed her mind as such. She spoke, Roger Crouch spoke, that's Dominic's dad, uh, he read um, Dominic's suicide note, and uh, not a dry eye in the house. It was incredibly moving, very sad, and Roger tragically took his own life a month after that. So in terms of having a driver to keep going in very difficult times when you're setting up a not-for-profit, that was it. So what we did was we took negative statistics, we turned it into something really positive. So we took role models into schools, we told their stories, no screens, no technology, nothing. Good old-fashioned stories, and the things we were trying to build were empathy and critical thinking. So if we can do that in our young people, we create a much wiser, more caring society. Amazing results, I feel very privileged to have been a part of it. it we, when, in my time there, we worked with 50,000 young people and across 250 schools across the UK. A lot of teacher training, um, a lot of transgender awareness, lots of really cool things that the government were really getting behind. But in, in that time, I was, um, I've gone from being a teacher to a chief executive, huge learning curve, and that's a talk for another time. But um, I was ended, ended up spending a lot of my time in corporate spaces, so I was uh, farmed out effectively uh, to our corporate sponsors to go in and listen to them and hear about their people and culture problems. And it came back to the same thing. I've been in hundreds of schools and many, many businesses, but it seemed that inequality was really coming to the fore. And what do we do with that? So these words came about, diversity and inclusion, kind of buzzwords, aren't they? You hear them everywhere. But to me, we've got to get behind those buzzwords, get beyond them and figure out what they actually mean. There's a business and a moral case for it. The business case is obvious. The research shows that you make more money if you've got more diversity in your leadership. There's in the, the top um, quartile of uh, gender diversity in companies, there's a 15, more, more likely a 15% greater return on um, investment than uh, their industry peers, and it's a 35% increase for racial diversity. So there's a lot of statistics that back this up because diversity means creativity of thought. It means different uh, solutions. Uh, it comes up with there's different ways of looking at the world, and I think we are all aware that when we have people around us who are different, we view the world differently. Um, but so many of us are surrounded by people who are very similar to us, who look sound and behave the same way we do. The moral case for it, um, you know, traditionally we know that society has been driven by, uh, and decisions have been made by a particular group. Uh, that is white heterosexual men, guys, it's not your fault, it's just the way it is. But in that, when decisions are made, we often make decisions consciously or subconsciously that further advance our own cause. So it creates societal inequality. 
So to enhance social mobility, to increase, increase social equity, we need diversity of decision making. And that's what we don't yet have in New Zealand or in Christchurch when you look around. So diversity is a broad and deep demographic across all tiers. And I sometimes talk to companies who go, oh no, we're fine with 50-50 women and men. And I like to point out to them, women aren't a minority group for a start. Um, <laughs> that's part of this how it should be. But they, they often have women will be the receptionists and paralegal secretaries and they're not sitting on the top of the pyramid. Yet. They don't have decision-making influence and therefore men are making decisions which further benefit their own cause. Not on purpose, this tends to be subconscious. And inclusion is the behaviour which makes people feel accepted. I still hear about people who change their names, the pronunciation of their names, Asian people, because they don't feel that they'll be said correctly in our companies. The same in the UK. And it's such a sigh of relief when they can actually say their names correctly. It's, but once you hear that from somebody, you think, my God, have we not been doing that? And that's just one example. So if we're, if we're to be open to all, we need to think carefully about how inclusive our culture really is. And... You know, you often hear people saying, well, our company's really diverse, and therefore we are inclusive. Look around, we've got lots of different types of people here. But actually, it's the other way around. If we create inclusive companies that we're really thoughtful, we connect with people that look, sound, and behave differently to the way we do, we will increase diversity. People will want to come and work for you. They'll want to come and volunteer with you. So it works in reverse to the way people often think it does. Just look at my clock and ignore it. <laughs> How do we do it? We have to ensure leadership is diverse to enable social change. So having one woman on your board isn't going to do it. Having one Māori person on your board isn't going to do it. We have to be reflective of the society we live in. And I'm, I'm actually kind of for quotas in a way, because I think to overcome the bias that has been uh, around in the past, we have to somehow equal things out so our decision-making processes are better. And that leadership, Everything comes from the top, so they have to believe in diversity and inclusion. They, they're not just buzzwords, they're part of the fabric of the organisation. And it goes across all these things, not just gender. Worldview is a really big one. How do we employ people that have got a different worldview to us? Because we're so attracted to people who are like us. We tend to, we tend to seek them out in a room. And I have to add Sula now that I'm back in Christchurch. <laughs> Uh, expand your social and business network. There's a lot of research that shows that people, uh, even if they're really inclusive leaders over in the UK, when they look at the people they've spent their time with during the week, they're people that look, sound and behave like they do. So, and the same with our social networks. So we don't understand others until we spend time with them. And that was the whole remit of diversity role models, is that you connect with people who, who are different to you, and then you empathise with them, and you think critically, well, why did I feel like that before? It's a biological response. Our bodies haven't moved on uh, from the way we used to think, so when we see people that look different to us, we move away from them, and we find others that look like us. And that's what it all comes down to, is us all making a committed and long-term effort to counter bias. And conscious bias is one of my favourite topics in the world. We tend to, so we have about 11 million pieces of information going into our minds at any one second, and we attend to 40. So there's too much information. We're trying to make sense of um, how, what, where the meaning is, what meaning to, to keep hold of, what we need to remember. So there's, uh, our brains, are, our bias is a very good thing. It's what we use to understand the world and to move forward, otherwise we'd just be frozen. But... 58% of chief executives in the United States are over six foot tall, and only 15% of men are over six foot tall. There is no link between leadership and height. So what's that about? That just shows me how dumb we are as humans. Because we're, that we're making decisions based on height. If you're six foot tall, you're going to make $5,000 a year more than someone who's five foot five. Imagine that over the course of your career. Heidi versus Howell is quite a famous case. Heidi Morrison was a, a, a real life entrepreneur. Um, there was a description written of her and her um, what she'd achieved and given to a group of um, people involved in a study. And then they wrote exactly the same description but called this person Howard and gave it to a different group of people. Competency, they judged them equally. They thought they were both good at their jobs. They really like Howard. He's a good guy. I want to work for him. Not Heidi. It's a bit selfish, not very likable. So there's a payoff there for women and success, and that goes with women and men didn't like Heidi very much, and women and men liked Howard. CVs with white sounding names are 50% more likely to get a callback. That's the same CVs that have just changed the names. Women in orchestras, 
traditionally very male orientated. They introduced, there was about 5% women in the 70s, they introduced screens, there's blind auditions. Um, so they sit behind the, behind the screens and um, play whatever they play, and there's a jury who listens. 50% more chance of getting through to the final as a woman once those screens were introduced. Um, I had no idea you played the cello with the genitals. <laughs> <laughs> But they also said to them, to the point that they asked them to remove their footwear because they, the jury could hear the sound of the footwear and it sounded feminine. <laughs> Judicial bias, if you're convicted of assault in this country and you're uh, white-skinned, you've got a 14% chance of getting off with a fine. If you're Māori, 6%. So you're twice as likely to go to prison for the same crime in this country. And disability bias is research that shows that uh, people, before they've even met potential employees, uh, a third of people believe that uh, people with disabilities are going to be less competent and less productive. So that's challenging, right? There's an awful lot of bias in there, and that's not just in the workplace. I'm often saying to schools, that, that, that um, unconscious bias is being applied layer upon layer upon layer through schools, through our health system, judicial system, everywhere, recruitment agencies, before people even get to the corporate ladder. Um, so we've got an awful lot of work to do. There's 175 different types of bias. That's a lot. But um, some of the really key ones in there, affinity bias is the most crucial, the one where we, we like people who look so behave like us. That's the one we most need to overcome. And people will say, oh, we judge them on merit or whether they fit for that company. What does fit mean? Fit means whether they go to the pub with you on a Friday night, and they're a good laugh, right? We apply our Western values to those people. They're not necessarily the best talent, not necessarily the best people for our organisations, and certainly not the people that are going to help us to change equality in society. Um, Groupthink um, is a classic, you know, you get together with your mates and you all agree, you look for the, you're looking for the same answers as everyone else. If you're um, a Trump supporter and you fill your social media bubble with right wings, I mean, try it for an experiment, it's really interesting. You'll start to like it. You actually start to believe the stuff they're saying. So if we fill our, our social media bubbles with left wing stuff, that's all that we believe. We're not getting a very rounded view of the world anymore. Confirmation bias is classic in research. You put a proposition out there, this is what I want to prove, I've got to find it. I won't see the things I don't want to see because I'm attending to so much other information. So in summary, my idea around how we have an inclusive environment is we need time. We make decisions so quickly because we're always in a rush. So what we just did there with mindfulness is crucial. We're operating out of our subconscious almost all of the time. So if we can slow down, attend to what we're doing, think carefully about the decisions we're making and we challenge that bias, we own it, it's okay, we've all got it, and we try and counter it that way and we do it collectively as a group. And connection. Connect with people who look sound and behave differently to ourselves. Expand our networks. I, I work in Wellington and Auckland quite a lot, and people are often saying it's really conservative down Christ, which is not. It's not actually, it's really cool. It's innovative, it's exciting, there's lots going on there, and we need to change that narrative, and we can do so. We, are, we have the opportunity as leaders, and all of us are role models in our own way. Every time you do anything and someone else sees you, they soak that up, they absorb it. So all of us have influence on others around the world, in the world, and we have the opportunity to change Christchurch and change the face of New Zealand for the better. I'll just leave you with that quote, a few minutes, eh? um, that I really like from the world-renowned social and business commentator, Dolly Parton. <laughs>